So, with many, many setups finally out of the way, we are diving into the ranked League Champions number four. I am joined with my co-caster, Dactor, as we get into this game with Empire against Norska. So we are going to see these Pistoliers uh, pushing up the right flank and the Norsk and Ice Wolves kind of zoning them out. The Ice Wolves do have Frostbite, so if they manage to catch the Pistoliers, they'll do a lot of damage, but I don't think the Empire player will allow that to happen. Oh, uh, it's and... interesting, by the way, to see Crossbowmen instead of Huntsman for the Empire. Uh, definitely won't burst as much against the Mammoth, but it's cheaper, so less of an investment required. That may be one of uh, the, the last... Uh, units chosen for Empire just to squeeze out a little bit more money. Uh, Fireball coming in, though, on the Demogriff Knights actually barely misses. I believe that was rough. aimed at the Jade Wizard, actually. But yeah, it, uh, it doesn't do anything. But now there's kind of a flank overload coming in on the right from Norska with a counter flank overload on the left from Empire, which I think is a really nice move. Yeah, and uh, one of the major advantages here for Norska is their major infantry advantage. And Empire is going to have to make that up with their cavalry, their skirmishers, and of course, Franz, uh, who's actually doing a lot of damage to Wolfric. Uh, That's true, in. but also a Knights of the Blazing Sun unit getting caught on the right flank and just totally destroyed by the mass skin wolves. So they're kind of trading right now, it seems like. Empire is pushing in on the Norskins left, Norska is pushing in on their right, and both are getting favorable trades on either flank. I'm yeah, not it does sure exactly that. who's winning overall, though. Yeah, there are still uh, some very large threats for the Empire. The ROR Demogriff Knights and Carl Franz are major win conditions due to their terror. And if Wolfric dies, that could cause a lot of problems. The game may very well come down to that if it does get close. But a, a little nice bit of a burning, head. burning head, actually. It could have done a lot more, I think. Missed the yeah, Spearman just barely, but. Uh, it does pull back the, the crossbowmen, though, and we are seeing another big engage in the center with the Knights of the Blazing Sun. Uh, taking a lot of damage, and it looks like they will be going down. Ooh, yeah, and the Royal Altar of Fights are routing as well. The Pistoliers and the crossbowmen have a pretty nice firing line into this, but... I don't know, Franz is gonna have to carry at this point. Uh, definitely... A lot of damage on the Empire's cavalry forces, which are really the big killing power in this build. Yeah, and uh, with with the cavalry gone, uh, and still many skin wolves and Wolfric at high HP, it's looking like Empire is is going to be in a very rough spot in this game. Balance of power showing this too. And aside from a uh, an epic snipe from friends, I don't expect uh, Empire to be coming out of this. With the win. Oh, a long distance boat actually routing the second crossbowman. That's pretty, it's a pretty nice play. Yeah, and uh, with more fireballs coming in on the caster, it looks like it's going to be army losses soon. And yeah, I'm going to call uh, this is looking like a very fast win coming in from Biden's Chosen. Yeah, certainly a nice game. Uh, now, the Empire does have a couple of range tools back online, so if they manage to somehow kill Wolfric, then maybe there's a chance just with terror outs. But I don't know. The uh, the Norskins are way too healthy, actually. Yeah, and uh, the main problem here is Franz without support can't really escape from the Skin Wolves either. Uh, full surround like this is uh, it would be a rough position even if there was support to come in for Franz. Some of the, the Demogriff ROR Knights charging in but they can't really get close with the high number of skin wolves. Uh, despite all of this though, Franz is still extremely healthy uh, and his leadership just barely hasn't broken. But as soon as that goes, uh, that will definitely Ooh. be it. He does get pushed a little bit out of, uh, of the surround by Wolfric, but sadly that is not enough and Franz is out. So, so game one going to Biden's, or no, to uh, Papa Palpatine, sorry. Oh, yes. A little bit of a misread from me there. Yeah, game one for Papa Palpatine. A, uh, although the game did drag on a little bit, I feel like it was uh, decided quite quickly. Um, mostly because, uh, like I said earlier, the infantry advantage was heavily on the Norskin side. 
And after the cavalry got taken down by the skin wolves, there wasn't much that uh, Biden's chosen could do there. Yeah, and uh, Palpatine went for like a pretty typical flank overload. Uh, I think that Biden's chosen had a really good idea for the most part with how to counter it, which is that he counter pushed on the opposite side, uh, trying to avoid the stronger flank of the Norskins. The big problem, I think, was that he didn't entirely pull back his left flank, which was the one being overwhelmed. So he lost like a Knights of the Blazing Sun and a couple infantry units pretty much for free just because he was so outnumbered on that side. Yeah, and, uh, and from there, it was just cleaning up for Norska. Oh, that out of the way, let's start getting into uh, the builds of our players. Uh, I guess I'll begin with Chaos, going over uh, what Pop, uh, Palpatine has decided to bring. Oh, it looks like looks like I have my scores backwards. I'll fix that in a second. Uh, but yeah, Papa Palpatine has brought two uh, Marauder Horse Masters, great for kiting dragons. A unit of Chaos Knights to contest the High Elf Cavalry. Really only Dragon Princes would be threatening to them. And of course the single entities. Which will be fought by uh, very likely Kolek. Now an interesting part about this Chaos build. Is not the Sorcerer. That's uh, very standard with the usual Pendulum and Enfeebling Foe. But he's bought an infantry line of three chosen great weapons. Which will be able to destroy any high elf infantry troops as long as they uh as long as they aren't getting uh shot at or charged at by cavalry so that out of the way uh Dactor, what do we have for the high elves so for the high elves we have looks like a mage of metal i it's hiding the lords and now it's techless with regrowth it's actually horse techless with regrowth and uh Interesting. It looks like there's no net. It's just uh, regrowth and feebling foe, and the bound fiery convocation, but without a net. I don't see that hitting anything. We'll have to see. Uh, now he also has. It looks like two sword masters of Hoeth. Uh, one, two, three, four spearmen. A couple of regular archer units, three in total. One unit of eagle claw bolt throwers and a Star Dragon in the sky, as well as uh, one Silver Helm unit as the Cavalry Contingent. Pretty elite Pretty build. build. Uh, very magic heavy. I'm interested to see how he uses uh, Plague of Rust. I'm guessing on Kolek in order to burst him down with the archers. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, how Do you know how uh, Swordmasters trade against Chosen with great weapons? Uh, I imagine it would be mostly an even trade, and I would put my money on uh, on the use of magic here, and uh, yeah, mostly the use of magic for tipping those favor, uh, tipping the fight in the favor of either player. Enfeebling foe should have a good effect. Same with pendulums, and on the high elf side, he can reduce the armor of the chosen, and he also has a fiery convocation. When with some good hits, uh, that could definitely swing the game for the high elf side. Yeah, it's really it really is strange to see bound fiery convocation without a net because the only time I've ever seen that ability used is kind of cheesing it with a net to kill down infantry units. But uh, we'll have to see. Maybe maybe he can get a hit with it. Um, yeah, would be pretty pretty impressive if he could. So and, uh, it looks like now uh, chaos is storming in. Yeah, uh, at, at the moment, it looks like uh, the infantry for both sides is quite even as the engage goes on. It's about picking these important matchups, though. And uh, a nice pullback from the Marauders, since the Swordmasters uh, would be super threatening for them, uh, is good. And a pullback of the Swordmasters to make sure that they don't get surrounded. Just some, uh, some nice infantry skirmish to begin. As for the oh, single entity fight, Kolek is getting uh, charged in by the dragon. And taking a ton of damage. How do you feel about this? Well, now Kolek is going to turn and start smacking him back. And I am i don't think we've seen a breath attack yet. Usually you see a more conservative play with Star Dragons. But choosing instead to go all out. Now, ooh, a nice pendulum there. Takes the Swordmasters down almost half their HP. And, yeah, and with, uh, yeah. with one Swordmaster down, uh, that would actually be quite huge. But a Fiery Convocation does get put down on the Chaos Knights. And it's on Papa Palpatine to dodge it, 
He oh, does see wait, it. Is he going to... And, and this is why you never see the spell. Yep. <laughs> A delayed <laughs> dodge. And dealing barely any damage there is huge. But the Chaos line still quite healthy. There are multiple units of Chosen still fighting. With only one unit of Swordmasters left. And the right flank of the High Elves getting collapsed on uh, quite heavily. Yeah, and a Plague of Rust on the Chosen with great weapons, but not much to actually shoot them or kill them. I guess the uh, the archers are laying fire into them, but I almost feel like it'd be better to uh, go after Kolek with that spell. But I don't know. It seems like Chaos is kind of winning across the board right now. The High Elves in major risk of just being overwhelmed as their front line is broken and the archers begin to have to pull back. And I don't know if the Star Dragon is going to be able to carry this game. Yeah, but it's looking like the Star Dragon is going to have to be the tool that does it. Since there's not, a, yeah, like you said, there's not a lot of cavalry left. The Sword Masters are going down. But the Star Dragon is still a huge threat. Uh, a breath attack coming down on Kolek. Oh, and an misses. attack animation. Dodging it entirely leaves Kolek still at half HP. But the Star Dragon alone with cycle charges can take out the Chosen. It can take out the, uh, the cavalry. And it depends on uh, how all well the fighting goes. Kolek getting brought down to actually uh, one third HP. But the front lines of the High Elves are now collapsing. This means Papa Palpatine can more rely on his infantry to do the work while keeping Kolek safe. Ooh, Teclis going in onto Kolek and the Chaos Sorcerer. He definitely doesn't want to do that and he is getting destroyed so quickly. Oh my, <laughs> oh my god. Good Every Teclis. single hit landing oh on Teclis. Oh my god. That Four was in a row. Like, like 10 seconds, and he went from full HP to <laughs> shattered. Yep, that and was crazy. He is gone, which means that the Star Dragon no longer has any healing. The leadership for the High Elves will be dropping as soon as Teclis exit the map, exits the map. And with the Marauder Horsemaster support, the this, this Star Dragon is going to have a very hard time getting in any value, even if it does fight Kolek. Yeah, and I mean, Star Dragons rely so heavily on regrowth and magic investment. So with the healing mage gone, I just don't see any way that it can carry the day. Yeah, and uh, there we go. We see it running for its life. But uh, oh, the Chaos Warhounds actually do break from terror trying to chase the dragon. But uh, even some very strong charges will have a hard time. Of course, cycle charging is still great versus infantry, but the High Elves are almost out of uh, ground troops on themselves. And with the banner rules, the Star Dragon would not be able to cycle charge. Yeah, it would... Uh, oh, man. Kolek has just hit, like, every single attack. It's crazy. And he dodged... Oh, my God, another one. And he dodged the, uh, the breath attack earlier. And another one... I swear, this Kolek is a sharpshooter, man. He hit, like... <laughs> Eight hits in a row on the high elf single entities. You never see that. Yeah, and we can we can take a look at his damage value there. He was actually Ooh. very low by the end of the game, but uh, the dodge on that breath attack might have just barely kept him alive there. Yeah, he got thirty two hundred value, which uh, I mean that that's pretty much all techless in the star dragon. He didn't really kill a whole lot else. Yeah, and the, the damage value really does uh, say it all here for, for these two armies. The fact that the Chosen were really able to outvalue the Swordmasters and Kolek getting in all of his damage uh, shows the, the good play of Papa Palpatine here, controlling his single entities well and keeping his elite infantry alive. Almost yeah. certainly. Almost yeah. certainly. But okay, getting back into the game. Uh, this is the second time we're trying to record this, so we'll just quickly go over the armies once again. Doctor, take it away with Chaos. Sure, so just to uh, refresh everyone's memories, we have a Mirror Guard, a Chaos Warrior, uh, we have two Chosen with Great Weapons, two Chaos Marauders, a Dragon Ogre, a Spirit Leech Caster, Colex Sun Eater, and Quad Marauder Horseman. Yep, a uh, nice skirmishing uh, build with a heavy focus on on the frontline fight, though. For Lizardmen, once again, you have the four Pterodon Riders to counter the Horsemen, and also a little bit more spent onto the Skink Skirmishers to really win the uh, the fight against all the Horsemen. 
This means that he'll have a little bit of extra firepower to throw onto the single entities of chaos, and this will very likely be important for pulling out a win. For his monsters is a solar engine and a feral stegodon to help with the monster fight, but not optimal versus Kolek. They'll do well as long as they have infantry support. And as uh, for that infantry, it's going to be some Saurus Warriors, of course, the Red Crested Skinx ROR, and the most important part about this build, Footgar and a Saurus Scar Veteran. The two heroes on foot will be able to uh, be kept away from for a lot of the time, but they might be able uh, to be useful in the infantry fight and also in the late game. What can man do against such reckless foot character usage? Yeah, it is uh, definitely unorthodox just because of the, the low mobility that, uh, that plagues all the foot characters in the game. Uh, just having low mobility gives you very little battlefield presence. And on, uh, on such expensive units, you definitely want to have that presence to, to command the field. So let's see how it goes. We're seeing a, a fairly uh, aggressive skirmish phase coming in from the Lizardmen. They do have the advantage there. Uh, and that does force uh, Zero to leave his horsemen in the back. But in doing so, it means that his front line will be taking some damage from the Skinks if he does not react. I am curious how much Rock Drops will do against this front line. If uh, the Rock Drops do big damage, that could be enough to turn the infantry fight in the favor of the Lizardmen. Yeah, he will need to land some very good rock drops, though. Those two chosen, will they, they far outclass the Saurus Warriors. Uh, and he'll need some way of dealing with them. Uh, either with heroes, summons, or his own monsters. Immediately, uh, we're seeing just some, just some skirmishing back and forth between, uh, between the Lizardmen range and the Chaos front line. As long as they're firing in on Chaos Marauders, it's a good trade for Chaos. And the Mirror Guard too, with their Silver Shields, are great for taking uh, the low AP shots of the Lizardmen. Yeah, now the Solar Engine is going to start firing in, I imagine, onto the Chaos, or no, onto the Chosen, and indeed they will. Really good target prioritization. The first shot does miss, though. Yep, not a, not a great start for, for Lizardmen, it seems like. Chaos has weathered the, the storm of the initial skirmishing phase, uh, which is a nice advantage currently. Another miss from the Solar Engine 2 means that the Chosen are almost in prime condition to fight the Lizardmen here. And the fight is about to get underway. Oh no, and uh, another possible uh -oh. crash from Zero, but we'll, we'll have fingers crossed and we'll use the time to explain uh, how how this fight uh, should go. Now the Lizardmen infantry front line is quite uh, quite weak here compared to Chaos. And oh, they need to the find ways to get in. support. Ooh, and uh, an okay shot from Hand of the Gods. Uh, actually looks like maybe all of the shots hit, but not doing too much damage. Yeah, interesting to target Kolek rather than the caster. Um, maybe he just doesn't think that the Spirit Leech is going to be especially impactful against his army, which he could be correct. Uh, now, the Stegadon is actually pushing off to the side to fight some Chaos Marauders, and Kolek is going to come and try and man-fight it. Now, Kolek is getting kind of caught up in a bunch of Saurus Warriors with shields. This could be a nice trade for the Lizard Men. Yeah, dicey situation going down. The Red Crested Skinks Reserve coming in. To fight these single entity monsters is perfect for the lizard men, as they don't rout and they do a lot of damage to uh, to the monsters here. And that could be an overextension from chaos. We'll have to see how it goes and if they can bring in more infantry to support. They are pulling back now and killing this isolated Saurus warrior unit, which is a really nice play. Now some rock drops coming in across the front line, doing some good damage but not critical damage, and Kolek now pushing into the front. I think it w he wants to probably be avoiding the foot squad for now. Um, he is down to half HP, and he's getting harassed constantly by Pterodon Riders. So he's probably going to go down eventually. The question is, can Chaos win the battle in the meantime? 
Yeah, we're seeing the infantry lines of uh, the lizard men beginning to fall quite heavily now. Their horsemen are still healthy. And if, K if Kolak does go down, that would be quite dicey. But but we'll have to see how well uh, how well the lizard men backline holds. The yeah, uh, the hero is, squad uh, too actually doing a lot of quite well. Chaos units kind of off in the shadow realm right now. One chaos marauder on zero's left, one chaos marauder on zero's right. Not really participating in the fight right now, which is a bit unfortunate. Meanwhile, the dragon ogre is getting caught and surrounded in the back, and they're actually terrified. I had no idea they weren't ITP, but they do get terrified. I imagine Kolek will be able to rescue them, but definitely not an ideal situation for Chaos. Yeah, and uh, the the combination of uh, these foot lords, even though we see that uh, the Chaos have really won the flanks against the Lizardmen, the center line is still holding out extraordinarily well, and he'll have to really rely on these Marauder horsemen to carry in the in the center fight. I think. And remember, there is one more hand of the gods, so Kolek will have another like 1k HP chipped off him if all of the missiles hit. And with only 3k HP, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, man, uh, we can see uh, continue sni continued sniping attempts going in on Kolek. Even the foot characters chasing him, uh, a little bit of a misplay since they shouldn't be able to catch Kolek. And it does mean that the center line will be uh, a little bit more rough for the lizard men, but... The Chosen do get routed. There's only one more unit of Chosen at very low HP. Uh, and it doesn't look like there's a lot of Chaos Infantry left. It's just a few Marauder Horsemen. Yeah, the Rock Drops, I think, are what actually won the front line for Lizardmen. Not a whole lot to zone out and contest the Pterodon Riders. So they were able to just float overhead, get the perfect Rock Drops, take their time. Really nice play, really patient, not rushing it. And now, ooh, the... Uh, the Chaos Sorcerer is getting caught, and he'll almost certainly die here. Although the Stegadon actually rampages at the most inopportune time. The Stegadon might get picked here. This actually would be a really nice play. Although, Cold-Blooded coming in, maybe going to be able to rescue him with the foot characters as well. Yeah, and uh, a sacrifice of the Marauder Horsemen just to slow down the foot characters. A nice play, but a bit of a nasty trade that, uh, that Chaos had to take. The, the, uh, the Marauder Horsemen, of course, are very important for their Javelins. And the fact that they're losing models to save Kolek is rough. But a charge in on Krotkar could swing things if he lands in some very good hits. Yeah, Kolek gets a really nice hit. Gets right back out. I, I must imagine Hand of the Gods is coming back online soon, though. Unless it's already been used twice and I just didn't see the second cast. Uh, let's see. We, we might have missed it. I'm not sure. Krotkar now chasing Kolek. And it's looking like it's still pretty contested. One uh, major factor for the lizard men, though, is that they are running out of ammunition. The pterodon riders are out, and the less ammunition they have, the more freedom Kolek has to uh, to continue cycle charging here. And now, has we'll the see second that. Manticore summon been used yet? I know there was the one. I'm not sure about the second. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it might have been just one. As we get back into the game, Kolak does go for the Skink Priest, but knocks him down. Doesn't get an attack. And, ooh, and then a bad attack animation, actually putting him into the midst of the Lizardmen infantry. But it looks like Kolak will be able to just barely pull out. Still Pretty done. nice Thunderbolt there. Kills quite a few infantry, actually. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Chaos is looking to be on a little bit of a back foot here. Usually they want to be getting into the fight. They want to be staying engaged with their melee troops. And the fact that he's constantly having to pull out here is sort of a, it's a bad sign for sure. Now, the Lizardmen are pretty much completely out of ammo. And the Chaos has almost total battlefield control. You know, they might be able to actually kite out the Lizardmen a little bit here. As a lot of the Lizardmen support units are really low. And there has been constant attrition and spirit leeching onto the foot characters as well. So... This is definitely winnable right now, I think, for Chaos, even if it's slightly Lizardman favored still. Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to have to come down to how well he controls Kolak Ooh, and a Kolak big gets charge. Kolak a really nice hit. Pulls out before oh, but taking a damage. Summon. The second Manticore summon coming in. This could turn the tides of the battle. Yep, there are Marauder Horsemen, though, and we've seen they can sacrifice themselves to keep single entities alive. 
And while the summon comes up, Kolak charges in again. But doesn't get any hits on Krokgar. Definitely would have been much appreciated. Now the Manticore is coming in. And it's going to depend on how well it does versus Kolak. Oh, a miss like he spirit swing. leeches the solar engine instead of Krokgar. That's a really big and unfortunate misplay. That is very rough for sure. Of course, Krokgar, the much bigger threat here. And Kolak getting chased by the Manticore, but he's built up some pretty good distance. And he has infantry to support too. Oh, but Ooh, he turns but... around now to man fight him. I think that's, yeah, that's a little bit of a mistake. But Foe Seeker actually, a nice, <laughs> a nice use there. Gonna get him out. And I don't think he took any damage there. Yeah, and Javelin. Chaos is, Chaos is kiting the Lizardmen right now. Uh, pretty funky, considering they took like an almost entirely melee infantry rush build. The Stegadon is getting chased off by Dragon Ogres. Yeah, and the Manticore is looking to be on the verge of routing itself, not even rampaging. Dude, uh, Kolek is out of here. He doesn't want any part of this business anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Kolek is at extremely low HP, and if he were to die... Many of these forces would be getting terror routed. Uh, their leadership is already very low due to them uh, taking so much damage in this Oh my game. god, Hand of the Gods! Oh boy, here we go. And it misses <laughs> it completely! Misses. No! Hand of the Gods, no! Yep. Gar. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, as some of you may already know, Hand of the Gods aims for uh, slightly above... <laughs> Uh, Colex model, and if he's not facing you, <laughs> oh my you, god, that's gonna decide the game, isn't it? I think Krogar so. Krogar is getting surrounded now. <laughs> that was oh, foot gar. Extremely rough there. And uh, yeah, a full miss with the hand of the gods, and a huge numbers advantage coming in from the chaos. This means is that really now nice Colex control, by game. the way. Like memes aside, this is really nice Colex control. He's pulling back from the solar engine. Not taking any risks, engaging with his other units first, just to make sure Kolek doesn't get hit, and he doesn't throw the game away. Yep, Krokgar at extremely low HP, but very high leadership. There is still an off chance that Kolek could get picked off here, and it's going to be up to zero to really oh, make sure Oh, but Krokgar that gets happen. wrecked. And Spirit and Leech, and he's dead. And there we go, Kolek pulls off once again to continue his cycle charging. He has the infantry advantage, which allows him to do so. And coming in likely onto uh, this nearly routed Bastilladon. Or perhaps just playing it safe. We'll have to see. I have no idea how this is an army losses, to be honest. Balance of Power says it's relatively even, but there's just a Skink Priest of Beasts and a Sora Scar Veteran on foot. And that's it. Yeah, the uh, Solar healthy heroes. Is getting chased off now. Definitely uh, the healthy heroes pulling the Balance of Power as much as they can. But this is very heavily favored for Chaos now. Kolek getting in uh, another hit on the Bastildon will very likely be chasing that off. And army losses for the Lizardmen will bring us to an ace match. That was a really nice comeback from Zero. I, I cannot believe that Hand of the Gods missed every single missile that badly too. But yeah, yeah very GG. Very GG. Great although, game. although very rough and GG for sure. Uh, that was an expected result for Hand of the Gods. Um, it aims at uh, slightly behind Kolek's head. So when he's not facing you, it can be risky to uh, to fire it off there. And we see the results of those misses. Only 900 gold value for Krokgar. So all in all, wow, just, uh, just a very, very good game. Uh, the Skirmishers too, staying alive for Chaos, I think played a huge part. Uh, while the infantry mostly got negated by, by, uh, Noob for Life. We have the ace match against Zero and Noob for Life. With Zero playing as a Lizardman and the Dark Elves for Noob for Life. I guess I'll begin on the, uh, the Dark Elf side. So I am a little bit more familiar there. And what we see are three Dark, uh, Rider crossbows. Great for hunting down solar engines. Great for hunting down uh, any monsters in the late game. And they do very well versus infantry too. Especially if they can get shots in on the side. This is the main uh, mobility advantage for the Dark Elves. Along with two Feral Manticores. Extremely strong sniping power. With Malekith too to back them up. And two Bolt Throwers also. It seems like this build is very heavily 
uh, suited for sniping out Lizardmen forces with a bunch of Blackguard and Spears just to hold and buy time for all of these powerful tools to get their damage in. And with that, Dactor, what do we have for the Lizardmen? So for the Lizardmen, we have a double Chameleon Skink. Looks like four Skink Cohorts with Javelins, four Saurus Warriors with Shields, a couple of Coldwind Riders, one odd Pterodon Rider, a Feral Carnosaur, a Slan Mage Priest of Life, and it looks like that's about it. So I, I do think that the Dark Elves expected Solar Engines here. That's what the Bolt Throwers are for, usually. Uh, we won't see them from Lizardmen, but we will see kind of a similar build archetype all the same. Just a couple of monsters, a really wide front line, and some decent skirmish potential, but I'm not entirely sure what in this build will actually kill the Black Guard of Nagron. Yeah, of course, uh, the Slan Mage Priest does have some AoEs, but the, it's not particularly strong as long as the Black Guard don't clump up. I think Especially... he has to burst him with the skin cohorts with Javelins and the Chameleons. I think that's his best tool against, uh, against the Black Guard. Yeah, and Chameleons too, they actually do put in decent damage versus Blackguard. Uh, just due to the fact that they're unshielded, and the Chameleons do have a lot of ammunition. But in this case, with only two, I don't think it's enough to finish them off. There's going to need to be cycle charging, rock drops, and yeah, I think a heavy focus on these single entities to really take them out. So uh, if I had to put in my predictions, I think that's how this game is going to, uh, that's what's going to determine this game, whether or not those black guard do get shut down. Yep. They do, uh, I do think they, they do trade pretty well against Saurus too. Yeah, I, I have to imagine so. Now, one thing that's interesting is there are no witch elves. Normally when you see a black guard build, you see one or two witch elves as well. Uh, not only as a source of terror, if you take the ROR's, I guess he has the Manticores for that, but also for the Rampage effect. So, basically, you can't cycle charge the Black Guard if they're Witch Elves, because you'll just get Rampaged, dragged into them, and taken down. So, without the Witch Elves, the Black Guard might be at some risk of just continuous cycle charging, although there aren't really good dinos for that tool from the Lizardmen. The Carnosaur isn't going to do much to Black Guard, so... Maybe it won't be as much of a threat. We'll have to see. Yeah. More of a single entity killing specialist here. We'll still be good if it can charge into Malekith or the Manticores. But with the mobility there, as long as Noob for Life uh, is able to keep them safe, he should be able to avoid the Carnosaur. We'll have to see, though. As the game does begin... And we're seeing the Lizardmen forces uh, pushing forwards. Of course, they need to play aggressively due to the bolt throwers. There will be a little bit of skirmishing, but generally with this setup, uh, Noob for Life will have to stay away from the Chameleon Skinks, and I'm expecting not a lot of damage to be traded either way. Yeah. Now, okay, I don't think so. You don't happen to know offhand if Skink Chiefs can one-shot Blackguard with their missile attacks, do you? I, I don't suppose that they can. Uh, if we look at their uh, at their damage... It's 417, it's... but it's non-AP against 100 armor. And it looks like... No, they wouldn't be able to, I don't think. It's, yeah, it's, if uh, they got it's lucky, spread out. possibly. It's spread out, I think, over... Um, yeah, if they got lucky. It's spread out over, like, three attacks, so they only do, like, 117 per attack, I think. Yeah, uh, if it so... does come down to the very late game, though, it might work out. Now... Uh, it's just a slow advance from the Lizardmen. There's good dodging going around. Both sides are negating as much damage as they possibly can. Just by skirmishing and dodging with their mobile forces. This is uh, good for the Lizardmen as they want to get in on the fight uh, as quickly as possible. But their front line isn't the best either. And some scatter shots on the Saurus mean that the Blackguard are going to come out of the initial engagement with more HP. I think that's uh, a nice advantage for the Dark Elves. Interestingly enough, the Lizardmen kind of moving around the flank, looking for a big surround, it looks like. But I'm not sure that they'll be able to uh, to get a ton of damage onto the Blackguard with the Javelins that way, which... 
Oh, Malekith actually just going in deep onto one of the Skink Chiefs is interesting. He will get oh. surrounded by the Skink Chiefs and some Saurus Warriors, but he does have Soul Steel in his back pocket. And he also has the Gaze of Malice, which I think could be a really nice cast right now onto the Saurus Warriors. Yeah, we'll have to see how this plays out. Meanwhile, on the flanks, Cold One Rider is getting chased off by Manticores. And Spears should be able to keep the Bolt Throwers running. But a few Saurus are beginning to slip through the lines. Yeah, and uh, one of the Dread Spears getting caught out. Now a Soul Stealer going down onto some Saurus and a couple Skink Chiefs. Not super impactful, but, you know, it is damage. And it will heal Malekith back up. Now a, a Banishment, a Wild Banishment with nothing going on to pin them down takes the Black Guard down to half HP? That is wild. That Banishment actually just got the perfect path. And now the Carnosaur coming in on a Malekith, who is full surrounded by Saurus Warriors and Double Skink Chief and a Carnosaur, and he's just getting pounded. Yeah, Double Manticore is coming in, though. They might be able to make a huge play, and there is a lot of fire support coming in. The but tail! a little bit too slow. The Feral Carnosaur can kill things with his tail? <laughs> Indeed he can. Uh, they do have attack animations behind, and that is putting in a lot of damage onto Malekith. Oh my gosh, the tail just slapped Malekith around. Yeah, not only that, we're seeing one unit of Blackguard getting charged by Cold One Riders in the back. On the verge of routing, Malekith too at very low HP, and all of a sudden things are looking very bad for the Dark Elves. They're having to throw their repeater crossbows into melee to try and save Malekith, but it's not even going to be enough. And this is definitely looking very, very bad for the Dark Elves right now. If Malekith gets shattered, I don't see a way for them to come back into this game. Yeah, the two Bolt Throwers are gone too. And just some some strong flanking and taking advantage fights with their uh, single entities have really, really swung things into the favor of the Dark Elves. We did say earlier the Black Guard would be a problem, but when they're fully surrounded, they are definitely much less effective. And really nice play. Uh, chasing off Malekith with the Pterodon Riders, just making absolutely sure he can't come back. Now, I don't think he's actually been hit by the Pterodon Riders yet. So there is a small chance that he comes back here, just because of the weird way that chasing things off works. Uh, yeah, we'll he is see. quite low on HP, so he might not come back. We'll have to keep an eye on that. If he gets hit by them, I think he just won't. But now they're actually... They just got force path on or the they just got auto path onto the uh the reaper bolt towards so maybe malekith can come back into the forest oh yeah, this is so small... close this is actually so critical this is the only <laughs> chance for the dark elves to come back yeah but and even so he no, is quite he low he's gone white line reached black guard are fully surrounded now and they have no other support the the dark riders are being shut down the uh, the Blackguard are too spread out to support each other. And that is a quick army losses for Noob for Life. The win going to zero with uh, with a rubber band victory coming back, winning it out against the forces <laughs> of the Dark Elves. Yeah, that was a really nice pick on Amalek. It pretty much decided the game. And also that, that one wild banishment cast. I've never seen that. Just the perfect banishment cast onto an unengaged Black Guard of Nagron, taking it down below half HP. Absolutely wild. Yeah, we also saw uh, just the, the extra mobility of the Lizardmen coming into play. Uh, the Dark Rider crossbows weren't really able to get that many volleys off before they started getting compromised. Even though the, the Black Guard were uh, a very strong uh, wall to stand behind. The, the long flank from the lizard men, there was a ton of cavalry moving in, plus the chameleon skinks. There wasn't a whole ton that the Dark Elves could do to prevent their Dark Riders from getting compromised. So there we go. Uh, a victory to zero. Yeah, and uh, with, with those thoughts out of the way, let's get into this match with Papa Palpatine against the green one. Bretonia against Beastmen, a very uncommon matchup. But, uh, but a classic, uh, which faction would you like to start off with? Uh, well, I guess I will go over Bretonia. They have uh, a front line of the standard four peasants, a couple of peasant bowmen with cox arrows, triple mounted yeoman archers, always good to bring mobile cav against the, or mobile archers against the beastmen. We have, it looks like, 
quad Grail Knight, including no three Grail Knights, uh, Grail Knights, Knights of the Realm, include, and then uh, the Knights Errant ROR. We have a Royal Hippogriff Knight, the super expensive flying cow, Alberic de Bordolo, and a Life Caster with only Earth Blood supporting it. Really interesting to uh, to see the Royal Hippogriff Knights. I wouldn't expect to see them in this matchup ever, but hey, here we are. So how about the Beastmen? Yeah, and uh, not to forget, there's also a Wild Felix pick there. Always uh, an easy target to get routing. But for the Beastmen, will they have the tools to deal with this Bretonian force? If we look at their army, it's a very, very cheap front line of Ungor Spearmen. Only a uh, 1600 commitment to that front line. With the rest of the funds going into uh, lo what looks to be uh, Centigors, Razorgor, and Minotaurs. So all very powerful high AP mobile units for the Beastmen. Except for the Warhounds of course. But a very strong force to slam into cavalry if they can get the charge though. These uh, forces have a very hard time. Or uh, they sort of operate like glass cannons, and it's very important that they don't take archer fire, and that they don't get charged themselves. So we'll have the to see how that goes. The of shadows is an interesting pick here, um, rather than the more typical wild or manticore lore. Curious yeah, manticores are. Uh, or yeah, yeah, usually those are much more common picks, but I guess uh, pendulums for the archers, perhaps some, uh, oh, no pendulum actually, Occam's Mind Razor huh. for, uh, for the extra weapon damage, looking to be getting some devastating charges here by the looks of it. I guess so, yeah, and even Death Lore is actually probably the most common in this matchup, but we're going to see a huge charge in from all of the Bretonian Knights. And it looks like the Razor Gorge should get some nice counter charges, which is exactly how you want them used. But the Peasant Bowmen firing in onto them should rampage them as well quite quickly. And that's the problem with Razor Gorge. They are kind of a use it and lose it unit because they will rampage very quickly. And once they do, they aren't coming back. Yep, they uh, let's see, haven't already taken a bit of damage, not getting too much, too many hits on the Knights. But a nice flank on the back does shut down these mounted Yeomen. But Ooh. will it be worth it? A huge charge comes in on the Centigors and they're going down. Meanwhile, in the back oh line... Oh my god, the Minotaurs get bursted. And, yeah, the Minotaurs. Oh, the, it's the it's the Alberic thing. Yep, the Alberic huge... thing kills a bunch of Ungor Spearmen. Okay, that's not important compared to the cab fight. <laughs> the Knights of the Realm die. Both the Knights of the Realm are going down, actually. Now, the Royal Hippogriff Knights and Alberic are getting out. This is a really nice trade for the Beastmen in the back here, actually. Yeah, despite getting in uh, a good charge, both factions rely on their uh, heavily impactful charges and a counter charge from the remaining Minotaurs really put in a lot of damage to the Bretonians here. Wait, I just realized there's Felix? Where did yeah, he come yeah, from? Yeah. Where did he come from? Anyway, he's dying to mortar, which I don't even know what to say about that. Um, yeah, poor Felix. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, the Knights of the Realm actually on this left flank of the Bretonians getting dragged down. And yeah, the Knights of the Realm that were on the right flank of the Bretonians also just getting wrecked. I mean, this is looking really good for the Beastmen right now, I think. Yeah, honestly, uh, oh man, I, I am not entirely sure. The Beastmen have definitely taken some very good trades, uh, but the Bretonians had uh they had a little bit more of a nice concave over the beastmen but i think it depends on whether or not they can keep their archers online and if they lose uh more more knights here another big fight coming down into the forest too uh how do you think this is gonna turn out i don't know the uh the royal hippogriff knights are totally healthy as is alberic having a really hard time killing them but man felix is just like tanking it man he's just tanking it against morgar he's actually killing morgar is, yeah, and that would be huge if he can take out Mogar. There is tons of terror coming. from the Bretonians, and terror routes are just the bane of beastmen here. Has Mogar even used his summons yet? I don't think he's used like either summon yet. Uh, I don't think he cannot I've die. Seen it. If Morgar dies, that's game deciding. 
Yeah, but at the moment, there aren't too many threats against him. There is a Gorble. Now, punishing Felix. And the caster looks to be uh, looks to be relatively safe for Bretonia, but the beastmen have pushed through their front lines. Bretonia still mobile is able to pull away, and the right flank has a one out for Bretonia. Alberic and the Hippogriff Knights are at full HP. Yeah. Um, now Sarmatian in chat asking how Felix can die to Morger. Well, he didn't take his item. I guess is one thing. Uh, but yeah, Felix will actually go down here. And he is routing, which I don't think it's super impactful. I, I'm not sure what Felix was entirely designed to do here. I guess in the late game, he could have been kind of nice for Alberic, but uh, it looks like a spawn summon coming in now. But, oh, it gets canceled. Morgur oh. gets knocked down, and the spawn summon gets canceled. So Alberic will not be trapped up here. Oh, oh but now but they come in instantly. And That's now weird. there's a bit of a problem for Bretonia. Uh, well, you say that, but Alberic just walks through them, surprisingly <laughs> enough. Well, it, it will depend on how, how this fight goes here. There is some skirmishing in the back, but depending on if Alberic and these Hippogriff Knights go down, I think that, that may determine how things play out. Alberic oh my gosh, actually Alberic taking is a getting ton of damage. Destroyed by Morger? I think it's the Gorble. The Gorble with the Gorble. big it charge. To be, it has to be the Gorble. The Gorble, the most overpowered hero in the game, coming in with the steel chair onto Alberic. As the life mage tries to save him. Yeah, and it looks like she does. Alperic will be coming back, but <laughs> it's almost he's army the losses Knights. all of a sudden. This is this game turned so quickly. It's with that I don't know if it seemed like the chaos spawn summon was instant when he got back up. I don't know if Palpatine was expecting that. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely faster than uh, than I would have expected, but Alperic does get a charge in on the Gorble. But takes a lot of damage himself is onto his second route and if he doesn't die here well he, oh my gosh no it's just army losses this was this was a su i mean i i did say that i thought Ooh. these men were winning like halfway through the game but i'm still surprised they won like that yeah the uh definitely a very volatile matchup uh a lot of these troops are of the glass cannon variety and do not want to be charged uh, and we just saw both both players charging in, counter charging, making plays where they can. Um, nice picks on the Minotaurs early in the game, but losing a lot of knights. There were a lot of trades going on there. Yeah, but, and the Gorble MVP, seventeen hundred and fifty value. I feel like you could have gotten even more, to be honest. It definitely was the Gorble because they took the damage values, and Morgur didn't do anything, so. Yeah, and uh, one surprising thing, though, uh, Felix, the surprise pick, very nearly killed out Mogur. And I think if he just, if he had barely been able to kill him or get him to rout, things could have definitely changed heavily for Bretonia. But the fact that he lived means that all of the troops were able to stay in the fight for much longer. It resulted in a win for the Beastmen. That was Foot Frick for a second, but no, it is Throg. A Shaman Sorcerer of Metal with, looks like, only Final Transmutation, not bothering with Plague of Rust. We have two Feral Mammoths, so yeah, definitely a little bit out there. You would more usually see the regular War Mammoths, but going cheaper, uh, the downside is worse stats. I think no Missile Attack and Rampage. Uh, then we have a front line of Marauders, four of them, with... Two Marauders with great weapons, so a very cheap front line. A couple of Norskin Warhounds and Marauder Horsemasters on either flank. And that looks to round it out, so how about Chaos? Well, for Chaos, we are seeing the usual mass uh, Marauder Horsemen heavily leaning on one flank with uh, one unit of Marauder Horsemasters. There are also two Feral Manticores, wonderful for sniping out single entities. But glass cannon units themselves will need support to stick in the fight, or uh, we'll just have to cycle charge. So it'll be important that Norska stays close together to defend their troops. And as for the infantry, it is the elite double chaos chosen halberds. So uh, yeah, chosen halberds, extremely hard to take down. But there are uh, definitely a lot of spells that will trade effectively into them, given that they are extremely expensive. Dragon Ogres 2 are there to support, and a Sartorial pick rounds out the Norskin build. 
an interesting an interesting uh build but uh generally pretty standard for both players we're seeing the game begin yeah with, uh, a, little skirmishing. Bit funky, a little bit funky with the double feral mammoth and a little bit funky with this super elite infantry core now the only spell for norska is final transmutation so maybe not the best to punish this double chosen pick i could definitely see them do pretty well here uh, now, the Feral Manticore actually going in really aggressively. Pretty risky because they can Rampage, and if that happened, it would be a pretty big disaster. But they are just going to get some free damage and pull back. Now, Sarthorial way out in front of everything. But I don't think there's enough mass to pin him in. He should definitely run away. Uh, yeah, and uh, no slows here, either. Really From uh, Hunter of Champions means Sarthorial can escape, although trading a little bit inefficiently. So, so far. Ooh, he's actually getting caught on these Marauder Horsemen. Uh-oh. Yeah, and uh, oh, he's taking a bit of Throg damage. Throg is coming in. He, Throg will get a hit on him. Oh, the oh, Norskin God. And wolves. The Warhounds. Now, if he casts Final Transmutation Overcast, this could be like... I don't know if it'd be worth it, but it would be something. Yeah, Huge trade coming in. Favor. Final Transmutation Overcast coming in, nuking all of these Norskin units. But he is trading a lot of Sarthorial's life for it as well. Um, man, that is so much damage on the final transmutation. Yeah, uh, trying to make up for, for that trade, but Sarthorial took a lot of damage and does not have any healing. A Manticore Ooh. gets Rampage 2, is very likely to die. Uh, but, uh, but that final transmutation did do a lot. The skirmishing advantage for Norska is definitely feeling pretty strong now. With all the skirmishers of Norska getting, uh, or Chaos is is leading in the skirmish advantage, just because of Norskin uh, Norska trading. But their single entities are definitely looking a lot stronger here. Yeah, and I'm not sure the uh, the double feral mammoths might get rampaged into the chosen halberds and just die. That's probably my main concern for Norska at this point because they do have rampage, and there's, it's not like there's cold blooded or something to make them unrampage. So. If they get caught in a bad engagement, they will just die. Very, very risky stuff. Now, a big final transmutation coming down onto this pocket of chaos now. With the Summoners of Rage and the Mirror Guard both getting caught up in it. And pretty big damage there. Not quite as big as uh, the Norskin cast, or the Chaos cast, but really nice damage all the same. The Marauder Horsemen, though, do have their opportunity to fire in on Throg. And oh, the wow, Throg is getting bursted. Yeah, uh, some dodging coming in now, saving his uh, saving his life. But he's in a little bit of a dangerous situation. The Manticore, ready Ooh, and waiting. And one of the Feral Mammoths rampages into out. the Summoners of Rage. That is really not ideal. Now, the Chosen Halberds not being there is a bit of a blessing. But one unit of Chosen Halberds is coming in. And the other Feral Mammoth also rampages. This is why you don't see these units picked. They are both rampaging. And now these Chosen with Halberds are going to be able to come in and presumably just trade very effectively into them but we'll have to see yeah another Please. unit of chosen coming in and there is a huge problem now for norska uh the fact that these chosen are at such high hp is very rough uh because there's not a lot of tools to deal with them if the mammoths go down but if they live you see uh as we see here with one of the chosen actually oh my god the the the, the rampage mammoths are like cycle charging the chosen <laughs> it's amazing yeah and uh yeah the, this is uh this is the only way to deal with with the chosen giving the norskin forces and it looks like uh that is actually what's going to happen one unit of chosen halberds 14 1400 gold down the drain immediately and the fact that these mammoths are sticking in the fight is huge for norska they are like being controlled better than a human could possibly control them it's unreal yeah, uh, picking the the right targets. Oh, uh, chain lightning coming charging. in onto the skirmishing core of the Norskins is going to just barely miss. That could have been a really nice pick, actually. Oh Sartorial dear! Sartorial getting chased down. If he goes down, then this game is definitely over. Yeah, for sure. The chosen are having a very rough time meeting uh, the mammoth counter here, and that means it's just the skirmishers and Sartorial. Who is extremely low on HP. Yeah, he is down to 500 HP. That's just like two hits from the big monsters of Norska. 
the balance of power very heavily in favor of Norska, as it looks like this could be a 2-0 victory for the green one. Yeah, especially with the charges onto these Marauder Horsemen, shutting down the last signs of hope or chaos here. Uh, one Mammoth does get routed to the Chosen Halberds, but causes them to be Terra routed on his way out. And with that, it's going to be army losses for Chaos. The win going to the green one. Wow. <laughs> uh, so th those Chosen were extremely threatening. But all of a sudden, just a rampage from the Mammoths and a few charges just destroyed them. They had a they had a very rough time in the mid game of the battle there. Yeah, I mean, I thought that the uh, the mammoths would just kind of sit once they got rampaged and get caught up and dragged down. Instead, they just cycle charged and killed everything. So, I mean, hey, maybe maybe the green one knows more about feral mammoth rampage behavior than the rest of us. Uh, really nice play with those uh, marauder horse masters as well. You can see actually they got like huge damage across the board really nice oh yeah actually yeah they they quite paid for themselves uh the skirmishing with the wolves too was great uh in general the skirmish game felt like it was sort of trading evenly and then uh and then just just the tipping point in the mid game dealing with the dealing with the chosen and uh, and also of course a lot of damage on sartorial helped out too uh, there was a point where the Mammoths were extremely close to routing off, but the fact that they stayed in for the rest of the battle was absolutely huge. Alright, and as we get into the game, going to be Zero playing as the Skaven. Uh, do you know what the, the score is right now? One zero. Oh, one. no, I did not ask, actually. Uh, it looks like Zero messaged me, so that means... Zero one. so... Zero oh. trying to do the comeback thing again. Yep, we've seen it once. Will we see it twice? We shall see as uh, we get into the game. I guess I'll go over the Skaven army of Zero. And we are going to see a huge front line. And it's not just Skaven slaves. Although a lot of it is. Uh, mostly clan rats and Skaven slaves with the unit of the Council Guard to back them up. A pretty standard Skaven infantry corps, of course, with Skaven, Skaven slave slingers too. But all of this is pretty standard. What we want to look for is the main army or the, the actual expensive troops here, and that's going to be a brood horror, just a standard brood horror, not the uh, pack master variant, and Throt the unclean, with many of his abilities. He has regen. He has a healing ability, Rat Ogre Summon, anti-large buff, a huge terror, and a great duelist, especially against Beastmen. A Plague Priest 2 for summons, very standard, and Rat Ogres also. Seems like your usual Skaven loadout, with now the Brood Horror support that of course comes with the update. Yeah, right. and as for the Beastmen, we have a vanguarded frontline of Ungor Spearman Herd. Uh, some gore herd in the back. Man, it looks like the green one really hates missile troops. Like, really, really hates them. <laughs> because, again, none of them at all in this build. He has a couple of Honey Nut's favorite centigores. It looks like three in total. A Chaos Warhound with poison. Uh, looks like, I believe that's double Razor Gore herd in the back. The ROR Minotaurs, the Butchers of Kalkan Guard, with their terror and regeneration we have a bray shaman of beasts with uh manticore summon and flock of doom and then also a bray shaman of death with doom and darkness and spirit leech so man that is a ton of magic there's no way he can use all those spells i think so that's yeah more of a utility pick swiss army knife style with the cost of uh of that money we'll have to see yeah. what he decides to use and uh the standard morger the shadow gave as his lord so this is definitely gonna be a very quick game i'm sure as uh, a rush build meets a relatively static defensive one yeah neither army really opting to uh to take any skirmishers this is uh the usual uh for this is usually what you would see for beastmen against skaven though 
Uh, especially in the past, the only difference is that now we have Brood Horrors, which do help Skaven a tiny bit. Okay, there is no way that Mortar Shot actually hit that Gore Herd. <laughs> that, that wasn't even close to it. Um, yeah, and anyway, I did forget so to that's, point out. That's a nice 300 HP damage. Uh, yeah, the Poison yeah, Wind so Mortars comboed with the... Uh, what's it? With the with the summon. And also an assassin lying in wait that I missed that can snipe out Mogur. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mogur always on foot. Really nice pick. And actually, one thing with uh, the Bray Shamans is... Well, one of them is on a chariot. The other one is on foot. But the chariot Bray Shaman should be able to roll through this Skaven front line pretty effectively. Now, the Council Guard, it looks like, trying to get onto the Razor Gores, which would be a really nice pick for them as the Razor Gores go hard after the Plague Priest. But the Plague Priest will get out. Now a Manticore summon coming down. I imagine that'll go after the Poison Wind Mortars or maybe Throughout the Unclean. Yeah, and uh, uh, it is, is deadly rampaged. effective there. So yeah. at the moment, uh, the main uh, damage dealer for, for Skaven are the Brood Horrors and the Poison Wind Mortars. Uh, poison Wind Mortars actually do stay operational, do a lot of damage to some Ungor. And if he can stop a mass collapse of his front line, he could he could do well. But double chaos spawn summon does go down. That does mean the Poison Wind Mortars are gone. Uh, and it depends on if the second line of the Skaven will hold. It is all Skaven slaves, so. Actually, the Poison Wind Mortars are still alive. And the chaos spawn are having trouble getting on top of them. Now, one of the casters of the Beastman goes down. It's the Death Caster. Uh, probably the one you want staying alive because it's the Chariot and it has more late game utility. Now, some nice Warhound play. They will get back onto the Poison Wind Mortars, finally shutting them down. But there is a Brood Horror there that could potentially peel them off with some support from Skaven Slaves. And, uh, man, this is a definitely a very chaotic battle, but I do think it's going quite well for the Skaven, all things considered. Yeah, many uh, sources of terror have actually broken off the right flank of the Beastmen. And in the center line too, uh, especially with the Chaos Spawn crumbling away, uh, I would I would say this is this is leaning towards, uh, towards the Skaven side. Yeah, and the balance of power agrees with you. And there really isn't anything to kill this Plague Priest. Like, it's a Mortis engine, and there are no ranged tools. There really isn't much in the way of tools to snipe it now that the Razor Gores are all going down. The Beastmen are going to rely super heavily on the Butchers of Kalkingard to hard carry this game. Now they're engaging Rat Ogres, which I have no idea how that battle's going to go. I have to imagine the Butchers of Kalkingard will have a pretty good time there, but yeah, I don't not know. They need the to do so much. Support of the, the Council Guard coming in, though. Looks like they'll be helping out the Rat Ogres, and despite a lot of summons coming down from the, Skaven, or from, from the Beastmen, the, the Skaven player here, usually uh, you would expect a mass collapse of their backline, but the fact that so much of their infantry is still able to hold, I'm uh, I'm not sure Beastmen are going to be able to win it here. Yeah, and all of the summons are gone now. This is the last Manticore, both Chaos Spawn are gone. A Spirit Leech on Dothrothia and Clean, but I mean, that's not going to do that much, I don't think, unless there's some crazy RNG with uh with this feral manticore but now it's rampaging so zero doing the smart thing pulling back all of his valuable stuff and allowing the manticore to just rampage itself to death as yeah the skaven pulled pretty decisively ahead on the balance of power and uh it looks like we'll be going to another ace match so nice in a classic zero fashion we see a lot of the mobility of the beastmen is uh, on its way out and the Brood Horrors, with their regeneration, are happy to, uh, to continue taking these fights. Even if the Manticore does land uh, a few hits, it's on its way out. And, uh, and as soon as it crumbles away, Balance of Power will tip even more into the Skaven favor. A nice, uh, a nice hold from Zero here. And yeah, just uh, I think that winning that uh, the right flank and having the front line hold for so long was really... Uh, one of the major deciding factors here. It yeah, seems the like... front line held forever, and also there just there was no ranged pressure from the beastmen. I do think a couple Ungor raiders are a really good idea here, just to you know focus down plague priests, brood horrors, etc. But without those, and with the razor gores getting picked off relatively quickly, 
the Beastmen ran out of single entity killing power really fast. Mm -hmm. A little bit of cycle charging coming in from the Beastmen, but he's on his way to army losses. And there we go. That's it for the Beastmen. Yeah, usually yeah. you will want to see. Uh, what's it? For for breaking the Skaven front line as quickly as possible, you want to be charging it. Like you said, Dactor, uh, firing in with your archers is uh, is very important for leadership debuffs too. And um, yeah, even having those, uh, yeah, throwing in the chaos spawn summons was good for the fear. But sadly, it was not enough. Uh, we even saw the poison wind mortars manage to stay online for longer than you would expect. And uh, yeah, and that, that's what did it. Uh, there was also a unit of wolf rats that I completely missed, uh, but they didn't do much anyways. Uh, sad for my play style, but nevertheless, very well done by Zero. Yeah, they, I think, actually blocked up some Razor Gores from getting onto the Poison Wind Mortars. So they actually, despite not having any damage value, probably paid for themselves right there. So the Lizardmen, they have a bunch of uh, Saurus, a couple Spears, two, just a single one, actually, to deal with Cavalry. Skinks are great, too. Uh, just awesome chaff for their silver or for their bronze shields. And Javelins to uh, counter Skirmish of Wood Elves a bit. And a heavy... Uh, cold one style build, putting in 4,000 gold uh, for for that cavalry advantage. As long as you don't get Miss Microd. Uh, I do expect Lizardmen to win the cavalry fight with the Revivification Crystal and more importantly, spells, Manticore Summons, and uh, and Heaven's Caster with, uh, with their AoE ability. Bokgar too, straying off the meta pretty heavily. And the Revivification Crystal. Oh boy, this is going to go quick. Yeah, generally pretty off meta. Now quickly, what do uh, you have for the Widows? We have Orion, Quad Dryad, Double Way Watcher, a Great Stag Knight, the Wild Hunters of Kernis, Double Glade Rider with Spears, and a Spell Singer of Life with Regrowth and Earthblood. So a bit off meta on both flanks, actually. I don't know why I said flanks, but both fronts a little bit off meta. As Orion and a Way Watcher kite build versus a cold rider rush which yeah i feel like that actually kind of favors the wood elves um generally way watchers are best against cavalry rather than a heavy front line um orion will also be kind of tough to deal with though croc gar should do a good job against him especially with the support of the revivification crystal and we are seeing just a really really quick launch into this game with croc gar and the cold one riders fighting a ton of wood elf cavalry but the uh the lizard men struggling here the great one knight or the the great stag knights actually doing pretty well and the cold one riders getting nuked down as croc gar struggling to find impact yeah uh, orion is a little bit out of position too but he does manage to catch uh the two casters together uh only problem for the wood elves right now is that they're losing the infantry fight but that might not matter if they still have a huge cavalry advantage. No, I don't think it would. Um, the Way Watchers also, without any cavalry, there's nothing to really pressure them. And, you know, this is kind of why you don't typically see Cold One builds, is because the biggest threat to Way Watchers in this matchup typically are the Lizardmen range tools rather than the Lizardmen rush tools. And you can see even Croc Gar getting kind of bursted here, as Orion is trying to get sniped by a. Uh, Feral Manticore, but the Manticore, I don't see that unit actually killing him through his resistances. Yeah, and no, Krokgar more importantly, now down below half HP. More importantly, uh, Krokgar is actually taking a lot of damage, though, and uh, he is at much higher risk of being sniped here. Uh, Orion does get, like you said, below half HP. Another Manticore summon could go down. And a wild snipe on Orion could change the tide of battle here. Revivification Crystal moving in to help too, but the Waywatcher fire could definitely tip the balance very heavily. The Waywatcher is actually whiffed that first shot. Now, I'm not sure if Hand of the Gods has gone down yet. If it hasn't, that could be a big cast when it happens. Uh, but man, Krokgar is really getting bursted by those Waywatchers right now. And they even have the RR ones, so there is a morale debuff 
a pretty hefty one on top of Krokgar as well. Zero needs to dodge for his life right now and really micro Krokgar effectively if he wants to win this game. Yeah, and while doing that, Orion does slam into the Riverification Crystal. He will almost certainly take that out uh, while Krokgar takes the opportunity to clean up infantry. Getting that infantry advantage uh, means that Saurus are able to push back Way Watchers now. It'll buy him a little bit of room, but without cavalry, the cycle charging is going to be brutal. Yeah, uh, these Stagnites, you know, I'm not normally a big fan of them, especially not in this matchup. But with all of the mobility of the Lizardmen dead and no solar engines or anything to pressure them, they should actually have a really nice time here. Oh, oh wow. Nice hand of the gods, but it's not its not even close to enough because Orion might have 1,200 HP, but what that really means is Orion has about 4,000 HP. Mm -hmm. uh, and, his uh, healing and uh, ward save is what's going to do that. Yeah, he has 66% ward save, I believe, against or 64% against physical attacks, which is the majority of this Lizardman build. And uh, the Hounds of Orion doing some pretty good damage into these Sar Spears. This, uh, this definitely is looking very bad for the lizard men right now. And this is, I mean, you can kind of see both builds a bit off meta, but you can kind of get an understanding for why the solar engine builds are much more popular right now. Uh, it's not ideal to try and kill the wood elves with cold one riders when they just don't trade particularly well into wood elf cav, and they also get bursted down pretty quickly by wood elf range. Yep, and uh, Zero really feeling that now is Krokgar. It's shot down by Way Watchers. Uh, his opportunity to snipe out Orion lost, and it's going to be army losses with a win from Razel. Yep. Well played to him, and it will be Razel against the green one in the finals now. As you can see, the Way Watchers doing Way Watcher things, combining for 4,500 damage. Yep, and. Uh, I think the Revivification Crystal, uh, although it does okay versus uh, in long drawn out games, with uh, in this one where both armies were engaged so quickly it really wasn't able to get its value. Yeah, unfortunate. Now uh, my game has frozen a bit. Yep. So... Uh, zero, with his uh, with his last breath, <laughs> having one more lag spike before heading out. But well played to him, making it to the semifinals. Now moving on to. The finals of uh of the ranked league champions number four. It's going to be uh it's going to be Razel versus uh was it the green one or Papa Palpatine? It was the green one, right? It was the green one. Wait, wonderful skins. So we have Wurzag with Brain Bursta, Gaze of Mork, just some cheap spells to spam so you can proc Bonewood staff constantly. We have two Doom Diver catapults, so we are seeing a bit of a sniping build. Uh, this is used to snipe artillery, lords, monsters, etc. We see, of course, the AP Gloonies, a Night Goblin Shaman with only Vindictive Glare, and I think that's the only magic actually, so really going all in on Vindictive Glare, which is a really good spell, but normally you see a little bit more variety than that. We have a front line of it looks like it'll be three goblins. Uh, Two Savage Orc Viggins, two Orc Boys, the Eight Peak Loonies, uh, a couple Night Goblin Archers, including the Rusty Errors, and a couple Orc Boar Boys, and a couple of Melee Forest Goblin Spider Riders to round it out. So a little bit of a skirmishing contingent, but really, the power in this build comes from the Double Doom Diver Catapult, which will be trying to snipe out all of the high value targets on the Tomb King's side. So how about those Tomb Kings? What do they got? Well, for the Tomb Kings, we are seeing a very cheap infantry line. Of course, there are the Kepra Guard and also the ROR Skeleton Spearmen. They're great for their poison attacks, and that's about it. Uh, a little bit more expensive, but Tomb Kings don't have a lot of poison anyways. So mixing them in is, is pretty good. For their cavalry, you got Nehekara Horsemen, much better than just uh, the normal Skeleton Horsemen due to their high damage versus low armor. Optimal for, for Greenskins, and if they get charges in the back of the infantry, that will be devastating. More importantly though, 
We're seeing two caskets of souls. Great anti-infantry tech. But if they get overrun, they will not be able to get their value for sure. To hold the line longer, we have Necropolis Knights. Good for uh, stone trolls and cavalry. And in this case, that's probably what they're going to have to hold up against. Other than that, we have last but not least, Arkin the Black with his usual kit. And also, a Purple Sun. Now, Purple Sun, oh boy. If, uh, if it's not respected, and if our green skin player here, the green one, does not notice that that does exist, he could run into a lot of problems there. Other than that, it's just a usual kit for Arkin. You basically take all of his abilities. So there we go. Uh, honestly, just looking at the builds right now, it seems like Greenskins can have a... They have a pretty heavy infantry advantage. They can flank around. Their cavalry will fight cavalry. And if they don't run into uh, a lot of these AoEs and don't get punished too hard by Casket and Purple Sun... I would expect that would be a victory condition for them here. Not to mention, of course, the Doom Diver catapults are going to have to be dealt with by the Tomb Kings. I am really concerned for the Tomb Kings because they have double casket against double Doom Diver. That's like about as bad as it can get in terms of build orders, I think. The Doom Divers should kill the caskets quite quickly. And those caskets are a huge investment. If they don't get any real damage done, then... That's kind of a game-losing pick. But we'll have to see. They are firing in right now, getting some decent initial damage, but they need to get a whole lot more, and the Doom Divers, I believe, kill them very quickly. Yeah, and there aren't really uh, any ways for the Tomb Kings to deal with those Doom Divers. Their cavalry can't exactly fight these uh, Orc Boar boys. They'll sort of uh, they'll just run into each other and sit in combat for a very long time. Now we do now have first shots coming in. Yeah, it looks like uh, vindictive glare. Oh, vindictive is glare. Going to be yeah, coming also in too. coming down. Overcast oh damage on the sorcerer, but not huge. A shot from Warzag too, and uh, a it's block looking like coming in. It looks yeah. like from the Nehekar horseman. Actually, a very nice play. That must have been intentional. Uh, for sure, and uh, it does block some damage, but will it be worth it? Uh, the green skins. Green one actually deciding to uh, to hold position here, as he does feel that he is trading up into these caskets of souls. Uh, and the Tomb Kings too deciding to hold. So both players feeling like they have the the advantage here, or maybe one of them uh, doesn't want to uh, advance due to uh, a lack of an advantage position. I have to now, see. The the caskets are actually killing the Doom Divers. I did not expect that at all. Um, and yeah, one of the Doom Divers routes. Wow, are the caskets actually going to win the artillery duel? Which they are not designed to do at all. They are completely designed to do the opposite of that. They are chaff clearers <laughs> and, you know, anti-cavalry. And the Doom Divers are explicitly, like, anti-artillery. So it's kind of shocking that the caskets are winning. But then again, when in a world where trebuchets are the best artillery duelists for cost, uh, I guess it's not entirely shocking. Yeah, problem is, though, the Doom Divers will come back, and it might end up just giving a situation where the caskets are always occupied trying to take out the Doom Divers, and that will buy a lot of time for the Greenskins infantry to start overrunning the Tomb King's lines, and it seems oh like God, that's what... Oh my God, both the Doom Divers are gone now. That's oh dear. Crazy. But uh, this is uh, seemingly to be the plan for the green one. He's taking the advantage of uh, the distracted caskets to move in into a frontline fight. Doing pretty well, but he does lose his Night Goblin Archers to Ark in the Black, which is extremely effective. Now, in the forest, we're seeing a huge fight with Necropolis Knights onto the Spiders and Boars. And that's looking really good for the Tomb Kings right now. They're taking Ooh, very FG efficient trades. Get, though. FG to get onto Ark in the Black. If he can surround him, but he needs to get those Boar Boys around him. Oh, and a Purple Sun coming down onto the Boar Boys. This could be a huge cast. Oh, boy. The Boar and Boys. Oh, my there we gosh. Go. Goodbye. So Ark in the Black uh, getting about a thousand gold of damage with two abilities, only one of which even uses Winds of Magic, is proving to be extremely effective now. He does get more surrounded though, but Nehekar Horsemen are coming into support. The Boar Boys are gone, and the Greenskins suddenly just have no more mobility. 
This is, uh, yeah, this, yeah, uh, this is looking really bad. This is not how I expected this game to go. Yeah, now like we have that. the Kepra Guard moving in. And the green skins, it's just Orc Boys and Goblins. Uh, the Fanatics, 8 Peak Loonies, are really the only way to deal with the Kepra Guard right now immediately. And it looks like that's what we may see. A huge Fanatic Bomb could go in. Ooh, but will it come in? It looks like uh, maybe the Fanatics were already used. Very likely. And Doom Saturday Diver Catapults. Is getting bursted down by the Caskets of Souls. The Caskets of Souls, I really thought they were hard countered in this play, or this, you know, by this green skin build. But uh, no, they are just killing everything. Pretty crazy. They they didn't even go, they didn't even take much damage, honestly. It's kind of shocking. Yeah, balance of power, though. Still fairly close to the center. Some big plays could definitely swing things. Eight peak loonies engage with infantry, but losing them is a huge loss given that the fanatics are so dangerous. Uh, but the greenskins have sort of reconverged now. They still have a few of their archers online. And the tomb kings are running out of infantry, especially the Kepper guard if they go down. Means it's just a little bit of tomb king's chaff left to win it. Yeah, and you know, once the chaff is gone, uh, we kind of talked about this earlier. The tomb kings really have a hard time dealing with infantry. And these caskets are doing really great damage, but eventually they will get compromised. And when they do, I mean, will the Tomb Kings have enough to carry the day? We'll have to see. One of the Doom Divers back on line 2 doesn't even look like it's targeting the caskets. Instead, it would actually be a pretty good idea to shoot Ark in the Black or the Cavalry here, since that's really the main way the Tomb Kings can deal with infantry after ammunition is gone for the caskets. Definitely. The ammunition is low. I don't think that Doom Divers can kill them in time anyway, so I would definitely prefer to see them shooting at Arkin. I think a Lord Snipe is definitely the best way for the Greenskins to come back into this game. And now it's a big fight in the center. The Hakara Horsemen and the Elite Necropolis Knights. If the Greenskins can win this center fight, I think that would be the play they need. Oh, it could be another FD to, to get. That might be a cooldown. And if it is, Arkin could be in a lot of trouble. Ooh, but another purple sun coming in. No, it's Expel from Warzag, clearing Ooh, out the that's infantry. that's a really nice brain burst, actually. Killing the Necropolis, or the... Yeah, killing some Necropolis Knights and nuking the Nehekara Horsemen. Yeah, and the uh, Tomb Kings are running out of cavalry, which is extremely rough. A Fanatic Bomb goes down on the uh, Skeleton Spears. Those guys are going to be crumbling away. Same with the Necropolis Knights and also the Nahakara Horsemen. An emergency summon has to go down too just to save them against Savage Orcs. Uh, which it may very well help out. But those summons are very important for dealing with archers too. Now, yeah, the, uh, the Doom Divers, it looks like, are retargeting now. They were targeting the casket, but now they kill a Necropolis Knight Halberd model. And if they can kill more of those, then that is huge. Yep, caskets of souls Ooh, are now out summon. of ammunition, but they've done a lot of work so far. There's not a lot of infantry left for the greenskins. Effigy to get coming down, but it's there's not a lot of follow up actually, and um, it bugged. Yeah, it Arkin work? is suddenly moving again. Uh, I'm not okay. sure what happened there, but we'll continue moving on. Uh, That's as Warzag, unfortunate. Now running away from an Ushapti summon. Uh, Ushapti summon is uh, very strong. It will crumble away eventually, but the and damage Warzag on Warzak is huge. Doom and Darkness, Spirit Leech, surrounded and dead. And with that, it looks like the Tomb Kings are going to win this game. That was uh, oh boy, <laughs> an interesting, uh, an interesting one. Yeah, Can't hold Ark and the Black back, I guess. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think there were definitely some. Uh, Definitely some miscalculations there at the beginning of the game. Uh, not easy choices to make, but based on the results of what we just saw happen, uh, the Greenskins definitely needed to be advancing at the beginning. And also, uh, trying to focus down the caskets did not prove fruitful at all. All of the Winds of Magic and the Doom Diver catapult damage was lost uh, trying to fire in on them. Uh, and from there... That, uh, that definitely led to enough of a disadvantage where Tomb Kings was able to pull through. I, I really am curious if anyone knows if that's an expected result or if that's like 
just wild RNG because I was under the impression that Doom Divers were really good against caskets, but maybe yeah. not. We are in a little bit of an interesting situation though, where green skins look like they might actually still pull it through. Uh, if they don't hit army losses, a lot of the Tomb King's troops would just crumble away. Uh, and that would actually be be quite the situation. The loss of Warzag will likely spell the end for the green skins, but they do have a unit of Orc Boys. They have a unit of the Rusty Errors. And if it wasn't for army losses, I think the green skins might actually pull through. Then again, Ark in the Black is quite scary in and of Ark itself. Ark in the Black with his summons on a chariot. I don't think there's anything to actually punish him here. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't see a way for the green skins to kill him, unfortunately. Especially when he has summoned back up. Um, now, with that being said, they are dragging down the caskets of souls. Yeah, I'm Necropolis sure Knights crumbling. Uh, balance of power right now, but it does look like army losses hit, which is unfortunate for the greenskins. Maybe they still had a chance, but it is what yeah. it is. I think uh, uh, had Warzag lived, that actually would have been quite the contested fight. But that it's going to go over to the winner, the Tomb Kings, manned by Razel. With one win up. Now, this is a best of three focus tournament. The one more win is going to end it for him. Uh, I think, man, if you look at those Doom Diver catapults, they really did not pay for themselves. Even the one with 500 damage, it really got that damage value shooting a casket that used up all of its ammunition. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh yeah. Like I said, that really surprised me. But if that's the expected result, then maybe the Doom Diver meta is just non-existent. Because uh, yeah, they they were pretty they were pretty bad there at doing their job, pretty much. So yeah, and uh, with the post-game analysis, of course, playing it, uh, we, you'd have a much harder time making the choices. But the the Doom Divers, I guess they should have been focusing uh, maybe the Kepper Guard. Maybe the Necropolis Knights, if they could get at range, or Ark in the Black, would have been getting in a lot more damage, putting in a lot more value, and buying the time uh, needed to advance forward with his army to uh, to engage the the really thin forces of the Tomb King's front line. Uh, yeah, just yeah. just looking at the army, it seems like an aggressive play is is what he needed, but. Uh, but with that, the Tomb Kings do move up. But that out of the way, let's get into this Wood Elf versus Bretonia match. Green one against Razel. Uh, which faction would you like to go over? Um, I guess I can go over Bretonia. All right, wonderful. So we have Luan Lianker with uh, his full kit, a Paladin with a uh, Guardian, a Damsel of Life with Earthblood and Awakening of the Wood, which can be quite nice to catch Wood Elf cavalry. We have, it looks like, triple Peasant Bowman with Pox Arrows, three Knights Errant, and four Knights of the Realm with a front line of five Peasants surrounded out. Now, uh, the Wood Elves, it looks like, are going for a pretty heavy Vanguard deployment. Uh, what do they have? Well, uh, as you do usually see with Vanguards, it's going to be a lot of Dryads. And uh, looks to be two Stag Knights, one of them being ROR, and also the Wild Hunters of Kurnos. A lot of magic damage from the Wood Elves. Really nice if you can get the charge onto the, uh, what's it, physical resist Bretonian Cavalry. Which we don't see for the Bretonians. So a little bit of a loss for the Wood Elves. There are also uh, some Glade Guard with Hagbane Tips. That means poison all around for both factions. And Orion. Which will uh, help with his Horn of the Wild Hunt. Give a huge charge bonus. It's looking like a like a pretty aggressive rush from the Wood Elves, but pretty vulnerable to the Bretonian uh, counter build here. I would I'm I am, quite worried. I'm very concerned actually for the Bretonians because they completely skipped out on magic damage. Completely skipped out on it. They have no magic damage at all. That is and true. They are actually facing the Lost Sylvan Knights, which you don't normally see. But we are seeing them, and it is uh, quite unfortunate for the Bretonians that this time they don't have any magic damage. Now, we are seeing a huge charge in from both sides here. 
it's going to come down to uh, the early engagements. I think Bretonia definitely wants to pull back and regroup before they go too hard in. But uh, maybe they can get some free picks here. They are just losing a couple peasants. It's not really a big deal. It's a couple hundred gold. That's it. Yeah, they will rally too. Yeah, so it's it's not a big deal. They definitely shouldn't feel pressured to force anything. As, oh boy, this Knight's Errant unit is going to get caught and completely destroyed. Yeah, the the main advantage of Bretonia here is that they have so much cavalry, they should be able to clear out the Dryads. But uh, at the moment, they're having some very bad trades. A Paladin actually getting caught. And like you said, losing the Knight's Errant is, uh, is very painful. Yeah, man, uh, this big blob of Wood Elves is going to be really hard for them to deal with. And an Awakening of the Wood completely whiffs. Uh, maybe a bit of a miscast there. As, yeah, man, the Wood Elves are really rolling through this Bretonian army very effectively. The Bretonian Cav is really not sufficient to deal with the relatively elite Wood Elf Cav, which is really weird to say. But it's true in this case. Yeah, they really want to be getting in uh, big charges uh, and surrounds to win the fight there. But these are all the cheaper variants of Bretonian cavalry. And if they're just retreating, it's going to be a very hard time. It doesn't help too that this great stag knights have huge physical resist. And you would need something like Lewin to help uh, in the fight there if you wanted to win. But the great stag knights do get uh surrounded very heavily here and a charge comes in on the great stag knights along the uh right flank here so if these two very important cavalry units do get taken out that would be a very huge swing for Bretonia. yeah but man without any magic damage to punish them the lost sylvanites are incredibly tanky that's what they're so good at and uh, ooh, a nice uh, Hounds of Orion cast coming down, nuking this Peasant Bowman unit. It will rout. And uh, we are seeing, it looks like a pretty nice flank charge coming in from the Bretonians onto the Lost Sylvanites, but they need to win this cav engagement if they want any chance of winning the game. Yeah, and uh, right now it's still looking extremely contested. Lewin, uh, flying up in the air, it is dangerous for him to take the engagement, but he needs to be putting in as much damage as he can. As he can. These Glade Guard with Hagbane tips, despite the huge cavalry uh, uh, numbers advantage for Bretonia, they've been too busy trying to recover, and only now it looks like they'll be able to shut them down. Now, a really nice pick here under the Spellsinger of Life coming in, and that will be very helpful at killing the Lost Sylvan Knights. But I don't know, I mean, even so, the Wood Elves pulling ahead quite significantly on the balance of power. And I think the game state is even worse than the balance of power shows because there is just nothing to deal with the Lost Sylvan Knights and there's nothing to deal with Orion in the late game anymore. Um, this is Bretonia's big chance. The Sword of Coron coming down on top of Orion and the Lost Sylvan Knights. If they can somehow burst them, then uh, there is a chance. But I don't know. They are just so tanky without any magic damage to counter them. Yeah, there isn't any archer support, but the Sylvan Knights are holding up uh, amazingly well. Lewin can't really get too much damage on Orion, and in this situation, Orion would probably win a fight if it does get prolonged. Cavalry does pile in, though, to help out, and a kill on Orion would be huge. We'll just have to see if it's possible. I don't think you're going to kill Orion anytime soon. However, they need to kill the cap, but yeah, oh no. The Wild Hunters of Kurnus, who are MVPs in this matchup, coming in with a huge flank charge and wrecking the Bretonian Cavalry in the flank. Man, I cannot believe that the balance of power is evening out, despite all of the Bretonian Cav getting shattered in the center here. Yeah, Lewin is still quite healthy, and the Paladin is alive too. Uh, definitely pushes the balance of power, but with all of the Cavalry forces of Bretonia now getting routed off, it's going to be extremely rough. Uh, Orion yeah. will perform much better against Lewin in a prolonged fight. He has anti-large, he has Cloak of Isha, and he'll be able to cycle charge with his infantry support. Yeah, very unfortunate, I have to say, for the Wood Elves that they ran it, or for the Bretonians that they didn't take any magic damage cav, and they happened to run into the Lost Sylvan Knights. But you do have to respect these picks uh, when you're constructing an army. You have to consider everything that your opponent might do, not just the most likely thing they might do. 
yeah, not having that magic damage cavalry was extremely painful. Uh, even having one Grail Knight to, to, to counter charge those Stag Knights would have been huge. But in the end, Razel does manage to pull out the victory. And uh, no, no fault to the, to, the play, to the actual play of both players too. Um, even though uh, the builds uh, might have been slightly favored for Razel, I do think his play with his cavalry, being able to cycle charge and making sure that they didn't get surrounded was very important for the win there. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. And it was actually the Wild Hunters of Kurnus, which are an extremely good pick in this matchup in general, which yep. uh, got 2,500 value. Pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, for, for the green one, he played well, but he sadly, he wasn't able to compromise the archers. And, uh, and yeah, he wasn't really able to kill the dryads. You can see many of their models actually made it out alive uh, during that battle. Mm-hmm. 